Hi, Comic-Con at Home attendees. I'm Ellen Wright, Associate Publicity Director at Orbit. We are thrilled to once again bring you some of the best new voices in science fiction and fantasy. This panel brings together eight authors on multiple continents whose books have been or will be published by Orbit in 2021. You're probably not familiar with them yet, but you'll definitely want to pick up all of their fresh, exciting, out of this world books this year. Each of the eight authors has chosen a question for the others to answer. You'll hear from C.L. Clark, author of The Unbroken, Suyu Davies Okaboa, author of Son of the Storm, Hannah Witten, author of For the Wolf, and Marissa Levine, author of The World Gives Way. Those four books are available now from Orbit. You'll also hear from Willa Reese, author of Wildwood Whispers, which comes out in August, Lincoln Michelle, author of The Body Scout, and Andy Marino, author of The Seven Visitations of Sidney Burgess, both of which will be published in September, and Lucy Holland, author of Sister Song, out in October. Visit the URL at the bottom of your screen to learn more about these books. And now enjoy the panel. We hope to see you in person again in 2022. Hi everybody, I am Sheree or C.L. Clark, the author of The Unbroken, which is a North African inspired novel about terrain, a colonial conscript, her arms, and the princess of the colonial empire as they fight over who's going to have the fate of this colony, uh, whether it will be free or stay with the empire. And so my question for everybody today is, what is one book that changed how you saw the potential of writing craft? Like either it made you think, oh, I can do that, or left you wondering how did the author do that? I think for me, that book was Neil Gaiman's The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Um, it was, when I read it, it was written like very simple language. I'm sure it's still written very simple language. Um, <laughs> But it really seemed to be a story about nothing at first, um, or at least like not world changing things. Um, yet as it went on, and as I read it, it felt very epic uh, in scale and approach. Uh, it was my first time reading a big story wrapped in a small world. I really love the ocean at the end of the line. That's a great answer. Um, mine, I have two. I'm gonna go with House of Leaves first off, which I feel like is kind of, um, a very safe answer for this, but as far as um, figuring out how you can also tell a story with form and with formatting and how that can um, lead to plot and all that junk. Uh, whenever I finished reading House of Leaves, I gave it away immediately because it freaked me out so much. I didn't want it in my house. So that's pretty good. Um, and also Pier and Essie by Susanna Clark is one that I recently read that was really uh, impressive. Um, also in form, but just in the way that the story itself was constructed and how it really slowly revealed itself. Yeah, you guys are basically picking all of my favorite books. Uh, House of Leaves is incredible. Piranesi was one of my favorite books of the last year. And uh, yeah, Ocean at the End of the Lane is a total trip. Uh, for me, one of my favorite books that really just kind of cracked my head open, and I talk about it way too much and I reference it, uh, in my own work is Invisible Cities by Calvino, just because it is, again, such a trippy book. And for me, it was one of those books where I finished reading it, I read it in like a day, and then I sat there and thought, how did they do that? Like, how did you create this book that is essentially plotless, but very strange and takes you to all these weird places. And so I've been trying to pick it apart ever since. Okay, so um, this book is a little bit older, but it is uh, The Fresco by Sherry S. Tepper. And I actually read it when I was a teenager and I have reread it many times, but uh, the way she handled the um, feminist and religious themes, uh, I think greatly influenced my own writing um, and definitely Wildwood Whispers. So that is definitely my choice. So Marissa actually took mine. I had a something planned about Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. But uh, so I'll second that one and maybe along the same lines for another book that just kind of blew me away with its structure and made me realize the infinite possibilities that fiction could have is Nicholson Baker's The Mezzanine, which is a book that the plot of the book, basically nothing happens. A man walks into an office building and he takes the escalator from the ground floor to the mezzanine um, after he's had lunch or something. But the book itself 
is all pretty much in the character's mind and follows all the random digressions and thoughts and kind of crazy things that he thinks in his mind. And that's, that's the whole book. And it was one of those books that, yeah, just made me realize you can kind of do anything you want in fiction. Great answer so far. I, I love House of Leaves, definitely a mind blowing experience. And I love the mezzanine as well. Um, my answer is, uh, is Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell. Um, which definitely falls under the category of how did he do that and made me wonder how he managed to pull it off um, and also made me really hopeful and excited about novels that can encompass um, just a slew of voices and styles and puzzle pieces and narrative threads but in a way that's still really propulsive and page turning and not like you know collegey plotless fiction uh, I just I loved it okay so I picked the Empress of Salt and Fortune by Nevo uh, because I think to write an epic fantasy in so few pages by using objects to trigger memories is really clever. And not that I've written anything remotely like it, but just knowing that that is possible. It's possible to write true epic fantasy in novella form. I mean, that that is a revelation to me. Hi, um, I'm Sui Davies of Kungmoa. Um, I'm a Nigerian author of fantasy and other speculative work. Um, my book is Son of the Storm, which is first in the Nameless Republic trilogy, uh, which is an epic fantasy series inspired by medieval West African empires. Um, the book, this book follows three characters who uncover forbidden magic and violent histories buried and have to struggle with the powers of a failing empire who intend to keep all of these things buried at all costs. Um, and my question is, uh, where is a favorite place or spot that you wrote part or all of this book um, or other books or stories? I have um, a heartwarming answer for this one. <laughs> I wrote uh, most of my book in the middle of the night whenever I was up with my first child because um, I had just had her. And so I kind of wrote it in a very um, sleep deprived fugue state. <laughs> so most of it was written in her room. <laughs> That's delightful. Um, my household situation is that I live with two other writers. My husband is a journalist, and then we have a roommate who's also uh, a novelist. And so it's tight quarters, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of space. There's a lot of scrambling to find space um, that where you can be alone. So my favorite place to go write actually was a cafe just down the way. Uh, I wrote the, the majority of the book there, um, just down the street from my house. It's called Jack Jacks and it's in Babylon, Long Island. Okay, so um, I write in a little log cabin at the edge of like 300 undeveloped acres in uh, Virginia. So it inspired Wildwood Whispers and um, lots of peace and quiet and isolation, which I used to appreciate even more than I do now after forced isolation uh, for uh, COVID, but uh, it was definitely conducive to writing. Can I come right there? <laughs> oh, come, come. <laughs> I've been We're way a lot of party <laughs> I was lucky enough to go to a couple writing residencies while I was writing the Body Scout. And one of those was a residency called the Mastheads in which there's these kind of cool cabins that the people who run it have designed. And they put them in different areas up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where the residency is. And the year I went, the cabins were dropped in the field of Herman Melville's Arrowhead Estate, which is the place where he wrote Moby Dick. And so I got to write in this cabin overlooking this beautiful field. And in the distance was this mountain, which was the mountain that Herman Melville saw out of his window that he thought looked like a whale and helped inspire Moby Dick. And that was a really, really exciting place to write. I, uh, I moved up to upstate New York to a house across from a cemetery, which was really on the nose, but uh, also kind of perfect for um, finishing up a horror novel. Um, yeah, so I'd like to say that I horrify my, horrify my editor by not actually sitting at a desk like a proper human being um, and writing. I sit on my bed surrounded by tons of owl cushions. But for the last book, Sister Song, um, I 
would like to go down the town uh, to a cafe um, that was, it's full of, it was Victorian and unfortunately it was called Trump's and uh, I just pretend that, that it actually wasn't called that, but it's full of 20th century, like early 20th century fittings. So it's really atmospheric um, and also squishy armchairs and tasty cakes, uh, which really does make a change from my lonely bedroom writing there. Pastries are required for good writing. So agree. Speaking of pastries, um, <laughs> my favorite places, uh, they're pretty apt for the Unbroken and um, the Magic of the Lost trilogy, but I wrote some of the Unbroken and revised the Unbroken and wrote some of book two in um, Rabat, Morocco, and in Paris. Um, I was there in both places for like research and language learning stuff, but I would spend half the day, like I'd go out for my morning run in the city and then like just sit in my little tiny room um, and Rabat or when I was in Paris, I was staying at the Shakespeare and Co bookstore, which the little room I stayed in I looked out the window and I just am staring at Notre Dame like just across the street, which is pretty amazing. Um, or I would run down to um, the Bibliothèque Mazarin, which is just, it's like this huge, like think old stereotypical Parisian architecture. Um, and then you go inside and it's just like silent, but just like rows and rows and rows, like all the way up to the ceiling of like old books and it's gorgeous um so those are kind I, of my two favorite places do you know I'm so jealous you stayed in Shakespeare and Co I've always wanted to see that it's it's an awesome bookstore it's an awesome bookstore for sure hey I'm Hannah Witten I'm the author of For the Wolf um For the Wolf takes it's a dark fairy tale that takes Little Red Riding Hood, Snow White, Beauty and the Beast, um, drops them all in the middle of a sentient bloodthirsty forest and lets them run wild. It's a fun time. Um, and my question is, barring science fiction and fantasy, what is your favorite genre to read? When I am not reading science fiction and fantasy, I tend to really skew in the complete opposite direction. And I tend to really like reading sort of experimental, weird, lots of stream of consciousness style writing. Cause I think for me, it just completely puts me in a different headspace and it helps my own brain kind of write better. And also it's just, it's fun to read the opposite of what you're doing, I think. I do the same thing where I typically read like the opposite of whatever I'm working on. So yeah, it really helps. <laughs> Nonfiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I love historical mystery. Um, the like the chonkier the better. I I love um, just I love things and and mysterious objects and I and I just that's the kind of books and things like that I absolutely love. But I also like when it has a romance element. I love relationships. And <laughs> I can't wait for your book. Um, but that is that is really appealing to me. Um, all you know, character driven and um, uh, personal relationships in a big chunky historical mystery would is just my cake. <laughs> I like to consider myself something of a genre omnivore and really try to read pretty widely across genres. So my my reading list is normally like a collection of horror fiction followed by a history novel, uh, nonfiction book followed by, you know, an experimental literary collection or something. So maybe one genre that I, I do love a lot is noir fiction or kind of hard boiled detective fiction, which is something that certainly inspired my novel. And I also do, do really like kind of weird experimental fiction that really tries bizarre things with structure and form, perhaps like Invisible Cities and the Mezzanine that I mentioned before. I do a lot of horror too. I like to like bounce back and forth between horror and Regency romance. That's a fun time. Nice. Um, I like, uh, I kind of gravitate and I think it's because there's a world building element to this kind of writing too, but 
I gravitate towards these like big, weird, imaginative reckonings with history and historical events like uh, William T. Bowman's Europe Central is like one of my favorites and Hilary Mantel's work as well, like Wolf Hall. Um, those were hugely inspiring to me. I, I really like that stuff. Um, so is it really bad to say magical realism? Because I love historical fiction with hints of the strange, like um, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley. Um, I pretty much will devour anything that Natasha writes because like, it's on the surface, it's purely historical, but underneath there's a strange presence of something other. And I really love that intersection. Um, you don't get it so much with straight SFF. I also, I was thinking one of the things that I like at least especially, especially not at least, um, this year, this past year, I've really enjoyed this, not resurgence, but like a, like a full blossoming of like the queer romances that's happening right now. Um, like I really enjoyed reading boyfriend material. And so I'm really looking forward to one last stop coming up. I think also like the same day as you, Hannah. <laughs> um, so very exciting in that in that direction but also I really like I mean I like history um so reading nonfiction history or um analyses and stuff I really liked reading Black Wave uh which is about um the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran um and how that has shaped the Middle East um or even uh Lawrence in Arabia which is about how T.E. Lawrence kind of witnessed um, the restructuring of uh, the Middle East, thanks to Britain and France, um, like Israel, Palestine and stuff like that, all during um, the World War. And so, um, yeah, just extra context. It's a little bit away from what I'm writing. Um, not that far, actually, but you know, a little bit. Um, and just really fascinating. I tend to gravitate most um, because I, I think I read pretty much everything and anything. Um, but just by judging by my library, I guess, what I most have outside of SFF is mainstream literary work, um, literary fiction and narrative essays and memoirs, um, especially those that center contemporary issues that orbit previously marginalized and underrepresented groups. Um, but I guess what draws me to them is that I love stories and or narratives, right, that pay attention to how they employ language um, and give themselves permission to like ruminate on small, seemingly insignificant moments, which is what I think these two genres slash subgenres do, um, you know, best. Hi, my name is Marissa Levine, and I am the author of The World Gives Way, uh, which is an apocalypse story uh, with what I think is a lot of heart and maybe, you know, a little bit of hope at the end of it, even though it is also a very true apocalypse story. And it's got a lot of other things going, like uh, uh, I spent a lot of time as I was writing and thinking about class and about uh, government structures, things like that. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun and I hope you enjoy it when it comes out. My question is, uh, what is your favorite sci-fi fantasy trope or cliche? Okay, uh, definitely down the rabbit hole. If, if your story has any element of down the rabbit hole, then I want to read it. I, I, that's my favorite, my favorite trope. What I would say is clones. I like how clones both are kind of interesting philosophically. There's kind of interesting existential questions that they bring up, but also they're just fun and provide lots of weird possibilities. Um, mine is by far the uh, like the robot or the AI trying really valiantly to understand the nuances of human emotion. Um, kind of like when the Terminator asks John Connor, why do you cry? Like, that's kind of the perfect moment. Or anytime a robot's like, teach me to love, like that kind of stuff. I'd love that. I don't know why. <laughs> when the Terminator asks, why do you cry? It's always the point where I just start bawling. That's the best. Sorry, the cat has decided to walk all over my screen. Um, okay, so for me, it is the chosen one. I love the classic chosen one story, but 
today there are so many ways to subvert it. So like you can tackle um, all sorts of sticky subjects you know, using this chosen one trope, like uh, one person's heroism you know, is another's tyranny, or looking at um, issues of choice like Veronica Roth did in Chosen Ones. So does being a chosen one conversely strip you of choice? And there's also still, I think, so much we can do with this trope. Surprising absolutely no one who has read The Unbroken. I am a sucker for um, bodyguard royal tropes and enemies to lovers tropes. Hell um, yeah! So, <laughs> and I obviously, if you if you read The Unbroken, you'll see that I'm I'm trying to maybe subvert, maybe just interrogate um, what those things actually mean, especially. Um, especially like enemy, like what does enemy actually mean? Does it mean you guys both want the same trophy or does it mean like one of you is killing the other person's family? Like what is a real enemy? And can you actually like get over that? Um, so yeah, I think uh, th those, are, those are my faves. I think mine will be the sassy slash snarky non-human companion or sidekick. Um, especially like those with good comebacks and like a, a strong sense of self-importance. <laughs> um, so everything from like um, the donkey in Shrek, for instance, or like the the, the robot um, from the recent Netflix film um, Space Sweepers. I think that robot's name was Bubs. Um, yeah, so from that to like all the snarky robots in like the Star Wars franchise. Um, yeah, um, that's like something I really love to see every time it comes on screen or, you know, on the page, I'm like, yay. Yeah, Shrek is truly unmatched. <laughs> Go Shrek, did so much for us. Um, my favorite, I really like the heel turn, especially like in a trilogy where the villain of the first installment has to team up with the heroes because there is a bigger villain, especially if um, the hero or the villain from the first installment ends up kissing someone. Like that, that is the best. <laughs> Hi, I'm Willa Reese, the author of Wildwood Whispers, the story of a young woman who travels to the mountains to bury her best friend, only to discover an eccentric community of new friends and old enemies, where a mystical wildwood garden challenges everything that she thought she knew about survival. My question is, is there an object of significance in your book? For instance, in Wildwood Whispers, there's a remedy book, and it's actually the torn pages of the desecrated book that Sarah follows through the Wildwood like a eerie trail of breadcrumbs that begins the story. My main character has a cybernetic arm and one that he owes a lot of money on, a lot of medical debt on. So that's a real object of significance for him, mostly because throughout the course of the novel, it's constantly getting stabbed and broken and healed again and then broken another time. And it just causes him a whole lot of pain and trouble. Um, in my book, there's, uh, there's a nano pal, which is a totally made up little toy that's basically a like a classic 90s Tamagotchi ripoff, um, you know, where you take care of your little digital pet on a tiny palm-sized screen. Uh, except in the book, the toy displays a really strange, horrifying creature that's not a cute pet. I killed so many Tamagotchis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a Tamagotchi that lived to 26, and I just remember this being like a really cool thing when I was 10. Um, yeah, I miss those. Um, anyone who uh, knows the Toa Sisters ballad that Sister Song reimagines um, will probably know about the bone harp. Um, it's a pretty ghoulish instrument that is made from the body of the girl drowned by her jealous sister. Um, it sings with her voice and it reveals the truth of the murder to everyone. It's absolutely the central motif of Sister Song. Um, and there's even a nod to it on the lovely US cover that I think my arcs might be arriving tomorrow. So I don't have one to show you now, but it's really, really pretty. And I love that the harp um, is on there. There are actually not any particular specific items that I can think of uh, in the Unbroken. There are like little personal symbolisms like um, the Baladarians, um, the Empire people, 
they wear grief rings for their loved ones who have died. Um, so the princess wears a couple for her parents. The evil general wears a couple for her children and her husband. Um, I think the other thing that might have some small significance um, plot wise, but maybe more later, who knows, hmm, um, is the, the knife that Luca gives to Rain. It's the first weapon she actually owns um, for herself that she doesn't have to give back to the empire, at least she thinks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I was thinking about this like a lot um, because uh, the, the central theme of Son of the Storm is power and it comes in like various forms. Um, and so many different representations of power have various objects sort of like representing that. So stories, for instance, like the power of stories and how they can be wielded. Um, there's a lot of like secret manuscripts and codexes and stuff like that in, in the book. So that's just like one example. But if there was one thing I would say it is this magical stone, um, which is slightly, which is different from the other more, um, from the other magical stones present in the book, because this one is a family heirloom that has been in a particular family's generation, um, particular family for generations. And for the first time, it sort of like leaves that family and goes out into the wild and it becomes the reason for a lot of upheaval that happens in the story as a whole. Um, so yeah, I would say that. Uh, this is a pretty easy question for me. <laughs> um, so the object of significance in For the Wolf is Red's Cloak. It is um, the quintessential red cloak that Little Red Riding Hood wears uh, in this book. It is um, like a ritualistic garment that she wears uh, to denote herself as a sacrifice whenever she goes into the woods. But um, over the course of the book, it's something that she holds on to, even though it's um, like a painful reminder because it reminds her of her sister and it itself goes through a transformation and comes to represent other things as the book goes on. So uh, my book has a couple things. Uh, one is this uh, old copy of the book, The World is Round by Gertrude Stein. The book is set on a generation ship and there's not a lot of paper or flammable things allowed. So uh, books come to be seen as pretty big. Um, uh, sort of art objects in themselves. So uh, my main character Mira has a copy of this book and she treasures it. And she also has um, this small religious, religious totem that's sort of the last thing that she has from her mother who uh, has disappeared well before the events of the book happen. And she has a very fraught and complicated relationship with her mother. So she ends up having a very fraught and complicated relationship with this totem. And it sort of ends up being this thing that she doesn't want to still have, but can't help but want to keep at the same time and goes through sort of a transformation just in the way that she sees her mother uh, over the course of the book. Hello, my name is Lincoln Michelle and I'm the author of The Body Scout, it's like this, uh, which is a kind of a science fiction noir novel about a out of date and underemployed cyborg who is trying to hunt down his brother's killer. And his brother is a star slugger in a future baseball league in which the teams are run by biotech and pharmaceutical companies. And there's also uh, weird mutated animals and revived Neanderthals and lots of other fun, weird stuff in the book. My question was, I was wondering if there were any non-literary influences on everyone's books, such as video games, stand-up comedy, visual art, anything like that? Um, I have two that are, uh, and they were just kind of like floating around my head a lot when I was working on the first draft, especially, and they are the paintings of Edvard Munch and the Sia song Chandelier. Okay, I love this question because uh, video games have always been hugely inspiring um, in my writing, especially the Elder Scrolls games. Um, and in my fantasy trilogy, um, there's actually a scene based completely unashamedly on a Skyrim quest. Um, for fellow Skyrim fans, it is the um, College of Winterhold one where you go to Labyrinthian and your mana gets uh, repeatedly drained by the dragon priest. Uh, it, that is so atmospheric, and I basically kind of rewrote it. Uh, Does in the my character fantasy take a, an arrow to the knee? 
Oh yeah, I mean that that's not the central motif. Yeah, arrow to the knee. <laughs> Days of adventuring are over. Now, honestly though, it is um video games are just so uh, inspiring. And I'm 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 often inspired by character and world design uh, in games. And I, I like to pay homage to them in my own small way. I was trying to think about this question because I mean the obvious answer is history. Um it was definitely inspired by I guess historical events and historical functions of like real world empires but the more fun answer um there was in particular one character um the apostate who i had my idea for her but it was when i was watching um um full metal alchemist and um there's an exile character in that series and i was like yes I want like like I can do this this religious exile. It's gonna be great, um, and so that's how we came up with um, the apostate character uh, on the rebels side. Yeah, just like Sheree, um, a good chunk of Son of the Storm is inspired by like um, various empires uh, of the medieval um, period in West Africa put together. But um, I think. In terms of like non-historical influences, it was Blackest King, which was um, Beyonce's visual album um, that came out um, right after the new um, Lion King movie. And I came to like that album late, um, but there was like a lot of the overtones that were reflected across the tracks. Uh, and, and, and because the whole visual album is kind of like a narrative, and a lot of like the overtones present there were like very reminiscent of like where I was pulling from uh, and they drew on some of these spaces themselves. So, um, so yeah, you know, that, that, those, those songs I did listen to a lot while I was <laughs> writing the book and I would feel like they, if, even if I wasn't paying attention, they definitely had a lot of influence on the final product. My answer, um, kind of has to do with music too. Um, before I figured out how to really pitch for The Wolf, I would describe it to people as if Brand New made a Little Red Riding Hood concept album. So um, working a lot, <laughs> like uh, that early 2000s, like grungy emo music, that's, that's the vibe. Um, and also the paintings of Waterhouse, I guess, um, were something that I found myself like looking at a lot whenever I was writing and kind of had a visual impact on it, I think. For me, there was this one particular visual artist that uh, actually ended up making it into the book. Uh, his name is Roman Apolka. And he did this series of paintings that are basically just him painting numbers starting at zero and just going across in a line. And his, his aim was to get to infinity. And he knew that he would never get there because, of course, eventually he would die. But it's just this insane series of paintings. And you would use the same paint on the brush and then it would just sort of fade out and then you would dip in again and you would start again. So it ends up being sort of this gray and white sort of matrix scroll across <laughs> this long, long, huge canvas of just nonstop numbers. And I just loved the concept of that. And it really stuck with me. And then it made it into the book and it reflects a lot of the themes in the book, I think. Okay, I love this question. Um, Kristen Ritter's um, Jessica Jones absolutely helped me with Mel um, because it it just inspired her character and her mannerisms and just her um, her kick ass attitude and just the survivor element of her. And I'm so crazy about Jessica Jones. <laughs> Um, so also, also all of the artists and artisans in the mountains, um, in rural areas, there are these, um, there are these groups, pockets, pockets of creatives, um, that are, that are so anti-establishment and, um, you know, they're, they're magic, they're magic to me. Those pockets, having grown up in a rural area, those pockets of people are magic to me. And I, so I made that literal in Wildwood Whispers. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Andy Marino and I am the author of The Seven Visitations of Sidney Burgess, uh, which comes out in September. 
It's the story of a former addict who gets clean to make a better life for herself and for her son. Uh, and just as she's achieved uh, a measure of stability and happiness, a savage murder she can't remember committing throws her new life into chaos. Um, and as she investigates what really happened, uh, all her old urges start to resurface and they take on this terrifying new form. Um, the book combines like the existential dread of the cycle of addiction and relapse with body horror and a touch of the cosmic. Um, and it all hangs from the bones of a modern thriller. Uh, my question for everyone is, if you could get any band or artist to write a song based on your book, who would it be and why? Okay, so Lorena McKenna, it says, saying Lorena is sort of cheating because um, she has already done a version of Twa Sisters, um, but hers is the classic James Child, um, just version of the ballad. Um, but I would absolutely love her to do a version of uh, my version of the Twa Sisters because she is one of my favorite musicians. Um, and I love her exploration of folk tales um, and the way she draws on different cultural traditions to create her music. That's actually why I'm so excited about Sister Song, uh, because I love that song. I love Lorene McKinnett. Um, and I just remember the first time I heard that, I was like, whoa, that's messed up. And I was like really young. And I was, it was like a, this story song. And I was like, this is amazing. Um, so, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't mind if she just happened to do one for The Unbroken. But um, the artist I'd be most interested in um, Ramin Jawadi, if I like, it's not like a, not like a band or a, a song song, but, um, if I could get a soundtrack or something, um, from Ramin Jawadi, um, for those of you who don't know, he's the one who did the Game of Thrones soundtrack, um, as well as, um, Westworld, um, and some other cool stuff, but yeah, it's just so atmospheric and he just, Oh, blows my mind. That'd be amazing. I, I know I've, I already talked earlier about like how, um, be how like what I a lot of what I listened to while writing Self the Storm was Beyonce's Blackest King. So like, it's like a match. I don't know in, in already in that way that you know if I was to think of a person or an artist to do that, it will be Beyonce. But um another artist that I think already, whose work already um, employs the same overtones in the same way uh, would be Janelle Monet, um, because a, a lot of what they already do like captures, you know, the essence of what I've written already. So um, yeah, so I would say somewhere between Beyonce and Janelle Monet in that sense. So somebody please adapt Son of the Storm so I can get this soundtrack, right? <laughs> Um, so I already said brand new, and I'm going to cheat and say two more. Um, the first would be Bear's Den, because I feel like they already kind of have written, <laughs> if my book playlists are any indication, they've already written songs for, for the Wolves, they just don't know it yet. Uh, and my third choice would be Chelsea Wolf. Um, just her, her vibe of like really dark, folky, heavy is what I'm going for. So Chelsea, call me. All right. So, uh, like I said, the world gives way is set on a generation ship and it's basically the whole world, whatever people could get themselves on board the ship. And then they've been hanging out together for like 150 years. So all the cultures are just sort of smushed together in this space about the size of Switzerland. And so a lot of the stuff that I was listening to when I was writing it was uh, were bands that kind of did a mashup of different languages or different cultures, things like Balkan Beatbox or Manu Chow. Um, so I, in my head, if there was ever a movie of my book, I just want that kind of vibe throughout the entire thing. And also like the entire book is is one long existential crisis so probably throw in some nick cave okay so the song for wildwood whispers has already been written also <laughs> blossom by eliza shadad is so perfect but uh if i couldn't use that one i'd want her to write another one she she has the perfect vibe for wildwood whispers like I'll say the uh, stoner metal band Mastodon, not really for any particular reason, reason related to my novel, but just because I think the resulting song would be really badass. 
Hi, my name is Lucy Holland. I live in Devon in the UK. Um, I'm the author of Sister Song, which will be out in the US in October. It reimagines the murder ballad, The Trois Sisters, where a woman drowns her sister out of jealousy, and that sister is later transformed into a harp. My version restores the third sibling to the story and sets the action in post-Roman Britain, when Christianity fought with pagan traditions and the tribal strongholds of the ancient Britons were threatened by Saxon invaders. It's a book about the bonds of siblings and finding the strength to tell your own story when the world wants to tell it for you. My question to the group, if your main character was about to enroll at college, what subject, and it can be any subject, would they choose to study and why? Oh man. Okay. So I think at the very beginning that both Terrain and Luca, and this is probably also how they would meet, uh, they'd be enrolled in some sort of like military track leadership and strategy class, which is a thing in the US, especially at like state schools. Um, I definitely knew some ROTC kids who were in those classes, um, if you aren't familiar with them. Um, and so that's where they would meet um, in their little college AU. But then Terrain would accidentally get sucked into some required humanities class, like, I don't know, like imperialism in the 19th century, thinking that she was studying war history, and then she'd end up meeting the rebels, and then, you know, would all be like downhill from there. So uh, that's, that's what happens when Terrain goes to school. Um, <laughs> so my main character is already a scholar at a university, so... <laughs> um, this is more just like a one-to-one -one mapping um, because Danzo, who's the main character, is already a storyteller, and he, storyteller historian of sorts. Um, and so in picking something from college, I'd say he'd pick um, something maybe like history and creative writing, um, but probably with like a minor or with, you know, like African, um, um, with like African culture, like historicity. Um, I think that would be like right up his alley. So Eamon would study philosophy and be completely insufferable about it. Uh, Red would be forced to go to college by her parents and in order to piss them off would pick something like underwater basket weaving or something else completely off the wall, but then she would probably end up getting sucked into philosophy also. I've not thought about this a lot or anything. <laughs> So uh, my two main characters, one of them actually is already very educated and goes all the way through college. That would be Tobias. And he, of course, went into sort of the generation ships version of investigator roles like the FBI. So uh, he chose poorly and he believes in the system entirely too much. So he has a lot to learn. But uh, Mira, my other main character, starts out the story uh, in indentured servitude and wasn't allowed to go to school much at all. But she's exceptionally good at lying and uh, talking her way out of things and talking her way into situations where she's not supposed to be. So I think she would make a great lawyer and she should go to law school. Okay, so Mel, I think, you know, I've told you that Mel is anti-establishment. If you can imagine Jessica Jones at college, that would be Mel at college. <laughs> um, so the irony is that she finds an unconventional education where she least expects it. I think my main character, Kobo, would probably study uh, history or philosophy or something like that because he considers himself somewhat intellectual, but he would probably drop out after a few semesters because he wouldn't really hack it in that environment. Um, my character, Sydney, actually does start to audit some classes after she gets clean and starts to turn her life around. Um, and she actually chooses advertising classes because it strikes her in a kind of desperate moment as the quickest path to corporate stability that requires sort of the least amount of schooling or knowledge. Like she could just be a copywriter. 